Um, all right, uh, everyone, welcome to the uh, afternoon session on security and privacy. Um, our first speaker is going to be Jan. Um, when it's time for questions, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, we have uh, folks online, so I'd, I'd like to request people to take the mic, uh, introduce yourself, and then ask. Anyway, take it away, Jan. and I'm presenting joint work with Andrew Hirsch, Peshwan Lee, and Deepak Garg on compositional security definitions for higher order wear declassification. Now, that's quite a mouthful, so I'm first going to explain what that actually means, and then I'm going to show you how we achieved what we're promising here. And the first thing you need to know is that this is a paper about information flow security. Information flow security considers a software with a secret or secrets, for example, a password, and it wants to prevent an attacker from learning the secrets or part of the secret. For example, that the password starts with a P. And in our work in particular, we are interested in how we define security formally in such a setting. Now, there's a very standard uh, answer to this question, a security property as known as non-interference, which in essence says that for a program to be secure, an attacker must be able to learn absolutely nothing about the secret. More formally, what it says is that if we have um, different versions of the program with different secrets, then they must be indistinguishable to an attacker. So if we have our bank software with our password and we change the password, then any outputs the attacker is able to observe, like the opening out of our bank, shouldn't change at all. However, in practice, it turns out this is a bit too strict. If we, for example, consider a standard login procedure, then all of us know that whether an attacker succeeds or fails in logging into your bank account does in fact depend on your password, and that that's usually considered a security feature and not a security bug. So if we want to allow these kinds of programs where we necessarily have to reveal some secret information, then um, we need something a bit more sophisticated. And what we can do is we can allow the programmer to specify which information flows they intend to happen. So they, you might, for example, let the uh, programmer specify that this failure here is an intentional release of information. Now, there are various styles of doing this. In our paper, we're mostly concerned with what's known as where declassification, which allows a programmer to specify where in, it, in the program uh, the information should be revealed and where not. This might, for example, take the form of such a declassify statement here. And the idea is that then uh, any information release within such a declassify statement is considered a legitimate declassification and should be allowed by the security definition, whereas any information releases of secret information outside of such a declassify construct are a leak and should be disallowed by the security definition. So that's basically our goal. We want a security definition for where declassification. But I promised you something a bit more specific. I promised you a security definition for higher order where declassification. That is one that works well for higher order programming languages. And that's interesting because higher order programming languages can be a bit tricky. And that's because we have these higher order values like functions or objects that contain some unevaluated code. And what that means is that they can leak new data when we use them inside of another larger program. For example, this function here in isolation is a value, doesn't do anything, particularly it doesn't leak any data. But the moment we actually use it inside of a larger program by applying it to an argument, it leaks the password to the public. So we don't really want that. So in higher order languages, we are left in the situation where we have these programs that do not leak data in isolation, so they may seem to be secure at first glance. However, they leak data when we actually use them, so they are not really practically speaking secure. And if we want to disallow such programs, and I think we should be disallowing them, what we really want is a compositional security definition. Now, compositional security definitions have the property that if we take a secure program and combine it with another secure program, the new program we get is also secure. So if we, for example, have the secure function applied to the secure argument, the resulting program is also secure. However, as we've seen before, if we take this function and apply it to a secure argument, the resulting program is not secure. So no compositional security definition would ever accept this function here. And therefore, if we have a compositional security definition, secure programs can actually be used securely, which is exactly what we want. 
They also allow us to do modular verification of larger programs, which can be quite useful, and they allow us to do meaningful verification of libraries, because by their very nature, libraries are always going to be used inside of larger programs. Unfortunately, the existing security definitions we have for uh, where the classification in the higher order setting are not compositional. And that's completely independent on which style of definitions it is, whether they use by simulation, some notion of knowledge or, or something else. All of these existing definitions only consider the program in isolation, and therefore they all accept this program here that will leak the password if we actually use it. So that's what we want to do in our paper. We want to come up with a compositional security definition for where the classification in higher order programming languages, but how do we actually achieve this? And there are two major ingredients that I want to talk to you about today. Logical relations and some idea that we call relevant declassification. But let's start with logical relations. You've already heard about them today from Amal, but let me remind you, they're a tool that's used to study the semantics of programs. And the way they work is that you define these relations, which are often indistinguishability relations, for expressions and for values of each type. And those relations then define the semantics of those expressions and values. And one of the many nice things about uh, logical relations is that they are compositional by construction. And therefore, if we were able to define security in terms of that logical relation, our security definition would automatically be compositional. And in fact, people have already managed to define information flow security in terms of logical relations, but they've done so for extensional information flow properties like non-interference and another style of declassification known as what declassification, where security of the program only depends on its input-output behavior. However, we are dealing with where declassification, where security also depends on where in the actual execution the data is being released, which makes it an intentional uh, declassification property. However, uh, we were able to do this, and I'm going to show you how. And I'm going to show this to you by first showing you how the uh, definition for pure non-interference works, and then I'm going to show you what we had to change to also make it work for where declassification. And this is where this idea of relevant declassification that I've teased before will be relevant. Uh, but let's start with pure non-interference. As I've told you before, non-interference considers a program to be secure if versions of it with different secrets are indistinguishable to an attacker. And what we are going to do is we are just going to define indistinguishability in terms of the logical relation. So we need to define this indistinguishability relation, this logical relation. So how do we do this? Well, let's start for values. If we have values of some type at some security level, then if the attacker isn't even allowed to see things at that security level because it's too secret, then they shouldn't be able to distinguish any value at that type. So all the values should be distinguishable, indistinguishable. So if we have, for example, secret numbers, any two secret numbers are indistinguishable, zero and five, for example. If, however, the attacker is allowed to see things at that security level, then what indistinguishability means depends on the type. Now, for most types, it's completely straightforward. It's exactly what you would expect, so I'm not going to say much more about it. However, for functions, which are higher order values, things are more interesting. And that's because logical relations treat functions extensionally. What this means is that we consider two functions to be indistinguishable if, when we give them indistinguishable arguments, they give us indistinguishable results. And that's actually where the compositionality comes from that I have been going on about. So what does that mean in practice? If we, for example, look at the identity function at the type public number to public number, then the identity function is related to itself. Because if we give it two indistinguishable arguments, they're going to be returned. They're still indistinguishable uh, uh, numbers. However, if we look at the same function at this slightly weird type of secret number to public number, so consider it as a function that takes a secret and releases it, so effectively leaks it, um, then the identity function is not related to itself and therefore not secure, because if we take two indistinguishable secret numbers, say 0 and 5, and return them, 0 and 5 are not indistinguishable public numbers. Okay, now we know what to do for values. What do we do for expressions? And we just say that expressions are indistinguishable if they compute indistinguishable values. 
So for example, these two programs down here, they're indistinguishable because they both compute three and three is indistinguishable from three. So far for pure non-interference. So what do we need to change to make it work for wear declassification? And the idea is basically the same as before. We are still saying two programs with different secrets should be indistinguishable, but now indistinguishable up to declassification. And it is this up to declassification that we now somehow need to incorporate in our logical relations. First, the good news, we don't really need to do anything for values. Logical relation, uh, sorry, declassification doesn't really happen in inert values, so we only need to change things for expressions. But then we do need to change things because now when we execute these two programs, there might be declassification and that means we might get different results in those two executions because we might have declassified different secret data. And that's fine because it was declassified. So we now must be able to look into this execution, figure out if declassification is happening and if it is, act accordingly. And that's the intentionality bit. So how do we do this? Well, we essentially go to a more bi-simulation-like setting, where we just look at individual execution steps on either side, and then require that after one execution step on each side, the resulting programs are still indistinguishable. So far, we haven't taken declassification into account at all, but now we're actually able to look at individual execution steps, so we can take declassification into account. So we can look, is this, uh, this e execution step happening inside of one of these declassifier constructs? And that's what these D and D prime things are telling us. And that's the intentionality. And then we only require that the resulting programs are still indistinguishable if we don't have what we call relevant declassification steps here. I'm going to explain what I mean with this in a bit, but the, the idea behind this is that we, if, if we have relevant declassification steps, then we would expect those two programs to behave differently because we have declassified something and therefore we give no further guarantees. So what's this relevant declassification bit I've been going on about? Well, these two uh, execution steps in both executions here are relevant declassification if four things are true. Number one, they must actually release data. If we don't release data, there is no declassification. Number two, the attacker must actually be able to see the release data. If we release data from some, say, very secure level to some merely secure level that the attacker is still not allowed to see, that should not affect what the attacker is able to observe about the resulting programs. Number three, the attacker must actually be able to distinguish the release data. If we release data, but we release the same data in both executions, or we release data that at least looks the same to an attacker, then again, that shouldn't influence what the attacker is able to observe about those two executions. And finally, of course, declassification must be allowed. If those two steps are happening inside of a declassify construct, then that's, relev that's relevant declassification if those other three things are true. If it's not happening inside of a declassify construct, we of course cannot allow in any information to be released, so we must continue to enforce indistinguishability. And that's essentially all I want to tell you about today. Of course, there's a bit more in the paper. We have a slightly different declassification mechanism than the one I showed you here, which is based on Flodox. We have to deal with technical details like silent transitions. We have to you know, deal with memory, which makes things slightly complicated. We have a type system that enforces our security definition, and we have a proof that it does enforce our security definition. And in fact, that proof directly witnesses that uh, our definition is compositional. And finally, we also prove that for those programs covered by the original FlowLock security property, our definition is stronger than FlowLock security, which means that everything we consider secure is also considered secure by FlowLock security. But in addition, we are compositional, so we rule out some additional programs. So in summary, we were able to give the first compositional security definition for wear declassification in the higher order setting. And in fact, it's the first for any intentional declassification property in the higher order setting that's compositional. 
and we expect our approach to be applicable more broadly to other intentional declassification policies. And what was this approach? It was that we were using logical relations to provide us with a compositional security definition, and we were using this idea of relevant declassification steps to add this intentional aspect of where declassification into our logical relation. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you for your attention. Um, I'd like to invite people to come to the front uh, with questions and just introduce yourself. Um, maybe I can start us off. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm curious, have you thought about like other pro how this extends to other programming language features? So it sounds like you've, you talk about uh, memory in your paper. What about, I don't know, objects, exceptions? Um, we haven't really directly thought about exceptions. I, I, I don't directly see how anything would be wrong with it. Uh, our language also doesn't have objects. However, um, f I, I've seen logic relations definitions for objects that don't seem to be doing anything that would affect what we're doing very much. So, so my memory of that is that you know an object is essentially similar to a function which has some body where we have an expression. It's just you know a collection of possible expressions that we're then going to evaluate in our expression relation. So I would expect that this should work. Okay, hi, I'm Julian hi. from TU Darmstadt. Um, I'm sorry if this is a stupid question because I haven't really worked in the field, but um, your work reminded me a bit of uh, the Lifty paper, which was at ICFP some, ICFP some years ago, which basically tried to track access control and also declassification through a refinement type system or liquid types, uh, similar thing. Uh, I was wondering if you were familiar with that work and if how that compares to your approach. The name rings a bell, but yeah. I haven't looked at it uh, in detail. So I can't tell you much except that it's definitely related. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I have one more question, um, uh, Cheryl from ARM. Um, uh, have you considering the question of duality, meaning have you considering modeling the uh, endorsement, meaning non-secret information flow into a secret site? Um, we have not. Um, when, when, when we deal with endorsement, things become sort of a bit more complicated in that then there's the question if you've declassified something and then, uh, sorry, um, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing things up. Endorsement is about um, integrity, right? No, no, I'm sorry, I probably used the wrong term, but I'm particularly saying if you have a public information, I want them to flow into the secret domain. Okay, uh, yes, yes. So, 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 so there's sort of two things here. Number one, Public information is always allowed to flow into the secret domain in our things because you know you don't leak anything when you uh, let public information flow into the secrets. Um, however, you could think about the system where you have some public data and then at some point you say, okay, now we want to make it secret. Yeah, that's it. And um, that's much more tricky. Um, we haven't thought about it. There's always this question if you have this combination of declassification and upgrading, essentially, that whether if you declassify something and then you upgrade it again, what happens to that information? Should it be, should it be, essentially, should it be considered as forever made public and it's fine if people know about it? Or should, do we need to ensure that at least someone new doesn't find out about this or something? Um, so we, we haven't thought about it, but um, my co-author, co she actually has a paper about uh, this, I think at last year's CSF, um, which is uh, where she compares various approaches of how you could deal with this in um, various kinds of definitions. But unfortunately, uh, she doesn't consider compositionality yet. So that's a very interesting aspect for future work. Right. Let's uh, thank the speaker once more. Um,